Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Dan Lynch joins me. We're going to be talking about Poodle, the translation service using the web that lets you internationalize your programs. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E. FLY dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Dan Lynch. Episode 248, recorded April 17th, 2013. Poodle. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, Libre, open source software. I'm your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEngine.com, bringing you each week, well, okay, most weeks, <laughs> the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, the projects that may fuel the stuff that you use every day, the projects you might not have heard of, all sorts of interesting projects. I'm coming to you once again from the 13th floor of the Howard Hughes Center in Los Angeles. I'm using my brand new Blue Yeti Pro, so if it sounds slightly different, except now what you're able to hear is the fact that my throat is scratchy, even that much better. But anyway, so it's all good. I'm I'm enjoying the new microphone. Uh, I'm not sponsored by them. I just kind of like the fact that the Yeti uh, really works well for me. Um, our, uh, oh, oh, oh for, I forgot. Sorry. Hello. Welcome back to the show. Dan Lynch, my co-host for the week. Hello. I was trying to think of a, a, another language to say hello in, but I'm afraid my language has let me down, but never mind. Oh, I can, I, I can use my bit of Spanish and go, hola. 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 I know I that. Say, oh, I, should, I should have got that, yeah. Hola. I was going to say, hola, V. Gates. And I went, no, wait a second. That's Spanish and German. <laughs> <laughs> I did study German for two years in high school and completely forgot entirely about it. Uh, and, and so the first time I went to Germany, I actually, all I could do was tell time. And you don't need that because you got freaking iPhone. So it's, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> what a total waste of two years of schooling. Uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. And I know that about the Spanish that I'm studying, too, is if I don't use it like every you know every day or so, a little bit, a little bit of studying. Now, the reason we're talking about languages is that our guest today is about translations. This is uh, Dwayne Bailey. He's going to come on the show and talk about, what's the name here? Poodle. No, we're not saying poodle. It's not a dog. P-O-O-T-L-E. <laughs> it's uh, an on-site, online web translation service. Uh, it doesn't translate the web. It allows you as a programmer to make it available to uh, people that are programmers to help translate the strings and stuff. You know, like when you'd say hello world uh, in Spanish, that would be uh, hola mundo, I hope. Oh, my God. Now, all the people that know Spanish are going to write in here and go, no, 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 it wasn't that. Uh, <laughs> it's just me trying to do this live. Uh, anyway, um, so it, it would allow somebody who knows both English and Spanish to see the Hello World string and then be able to type it in their native language. So uh, we've had, uh, what's the other show that uh, we did a while back? Zapata? Was that the name of it? Zanata. Uh, Zanata. There we go. Uh, so we'll have to ask the, our guest to sort of compare this and that. And next week, as if you're not getting enough translation services in your life, we have WebLate, which is yet another web translation service. So we'll have to ask him about that as well. But let's also ask them about him. So that way he gets the, the other guy gets the last word. That'll be kind of fun. Uh, what have you, uh, uh, you have anything to say, Dan, first before we get into the show? Uh, no, I, I think we should we should go and uh, find out more about about poodle. Although I, I I am conscious that it sounds like we're saying poodle, so I'm glad you uh, glad you addressed <laughs> that one. Um, Want to yeah, spell but it out? No, let, let's find out more about it. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Dwayne Bailey. Welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be here. And where are you speaking to us from? I am actually just outside London, but I hail from uh, South Africa. Wow, you could have actually walked over to Dan's place. <laughs> so not quite. But. Oh, not quite. Oh, yeah, sorry. You're not. I, keep, I Somehow I seem to think that London is like all of England. So I, it's it's a strange non, non view, not appropriate view, but that's okay. Great. So I took a stab at describing what Poodle is. And since we've actually interviewed some other shows that talk about web translation services, I might have done a pretty good job at it. But why don't you go ahead and give us the 30,000 foot view of what Poodle is and what it is. Uh, what problem it solves. Sure. Um, so Poodle is a web-based translation system. Um, a lot of people talk about crowdsourcing um, translations. We kind of like to think of them as community translation services. So essentially allowing a project to expose um, translations through the web to allow communities to participate. So it's really a um, web platform to allow people who are working on your project to supply um, translations and translate your product. Let's back up a step here. So uh, I'm 
well, I'm, I'm no longer just monolingual. I'm sort of one and a half languages and slowly going into Spanish. <laughs> Getting to the point where I can read the newspaper now and I can uh, sort of have a bar-oriented conversation because I learned those words first. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, well, when, what is the problem when a programmer is writing a program uh, involved in translation? I mean, why, why is this a, a difficult subject and only just now being really addressed well? Well, I think um, so. a few things to it. One is that um, programmers, I think, you know, we, we're used to speaking a language of, of software um, and code, mm -hmm. and we can collaborate around that. And suddenly we're looking at how do we bring people in who are going to translate our piece of software, and we're not going to actually be able to review any of their translations. So part of what we're trying to achieve in Poodle is to how do you build an environment in which um, you can help people who are new at translating and trust them to translate for you. Um, and then from a software perspective, from that, the programmer's perspective, you know, you're sitting here, especially in, in, in the internet as we're sitting now, you really are starting to be exposed to the reality that people are not just speaking English and there are a lot of people out there that could benefit from your software. So it's, it's really from a programming perspective, it's how do I take my piece of software and get it translated and available in a whole lot of languages. So in terms, in Poodle, we're not really dealing with the side of the software that makes it translatable. You know, so changing the code to make sure that you can extract the text, um, et cetera. We're looking at once you've extracted it, how do you present that to your community and allow them to then translate it for you? So in other words, if, as a programmer, I would have like, uh, say in C, it'd be a printf. I'd say printf, uh, hello, what is your name? Uh, obviously, I'm writing that in English because that's my native mm -hmm. tongue. Um, so there's some steps involved in getting that string into some other place that Poodle can present to say someone who speaks French and translate that into French. And there has to be some other steps that I do as a programmer to also then say, when you're running in English, look at this file or something, or when you're running in French, look sure. at that file, something like that? Yeah, so from the from the technical side, if you were a programmer translate, you know, wanting your software translated, you've written it, um, the first step is usually that you mark it up or, or, or put your texts that need to be translated in some place. So let's keep it simple and say you've, you know, you've written the software, um, you just mark up the text in your existing um, code, and if we take the kind of the um, free software kind of model, then they have tools that extract um, that and put it in a file we call a PO file, which is really simply it's a source and target um, kind of file, or you could think of it in some ways a key value pair. You've got the source text, the English, and what you're going to translate it to. Um, and then where Poodle steps in is some, you know, the translator, the programmer then puts that file up to be translated and we present that to translate to translators um, they just see the text that they need to translate they don't see the format behind that once they finish that from a programming perspective you taking your PO file back putting that in your code um, when you deliver your code um, it's really the operating system that's making the decision so it's looking at what language has this user set their uh, their software to so their locale setting and working out hey do we have a translation for French Yes, we do. Let's present the interface in French. So that's the kind of simplistic view of, of how the process works from a programming perspective and how we kind of deliver translated software to users um, on their platforms. Of course, uh, I know from the little bit of other languages that I've studied that there's complications involved with that, like, uh, you know, uh, gender selection of proper gender for, you know, uh, nouns and verbs. And um, also, how do, we, how do we do plurals and things like that? Um, what, how does the, is, is there ways in the software to manage that? Like I want to say I have five apples or I want to have one apple. Obviously I have to know that pluralization in English has followed certain rules. Um, does, the, does the software manage that sort of thing? Yes, yeah, so that's something that, um, so that's really looking at your, at your layer in terms of internationalization, we call it. So that's looking at the things that we make decisions about how do you write dates and times, etc. In terms of the gender stuff, um, it's, we're not really that advanced in terms of the open source world, and I don't think in terms of the commercial world either in terms of managing that properly. We do plurals pretty well. And so if you're looking at it from the Poodle perspective, that's just about how do we take um, the plural form and present that to a translator. To understand it from the programming perspective, um, it does get quite complicated. Like I think in Arabic, we've got six forms. So if you're thinking about English, 
you've got um, one file, two files, three files. Um, so you can see the plural happening there, the change from one to two. Um, and in fact, zero, if you think about it in English, you have zero files, so that's the plural form. So we only have two forms, that kind of singular and plural. In mm -hmm. Arabic, you've got six. So you're kind of, you're writing an equation to represent that. You know, when we step through the numbers, when do we switch into that plural form? So in terms of presenting that to the translator, it's, it's actually quite a complex problem in terms of presenting to them. Um, a is trying to get them to tell you how their language works. Mm. Um, once we've got that, that's kind of solved. Um, so we, we solve that once. Um, and then when they're translated, they're obviously going to see the two English strings, um, one file, many files. And um, then we're going to have a situation where um, they're going to then, in their translation, are going to have to provide six different translations. Um, and know how to work that. So it's a, it's one once we've educated translators, they're pretty good at doing it. Um, but it's quite, the, the problem is actually educating programmers about how plural forms should be work, worked and written. So sometimes we'll get people saying, um, in English they'll say, oh, we've got one file and they'll write it out, not, they won't use a number. So it'll be, we have no files and we have one file. So they're using a zero case and a one case um, and not realizing that in some languages the case that we use for one like one file will repeat at one and eleven and twenty one and thirty one etc so mm. it's quite hard on the on the programmer side getting programmers to understand how plural forms work and that um, so for instance I think one of the languages I looked at will literally have it's got a one eleven twenty one and that appears again at 101, 111. So you have a form that will appear at those points. So making decisions, like thinking like you speak English, like we'll just use this one file and write it out in full because that looks really nice. Um, in some languages, it's just not going to work. <laughs> oh, I, I bet the people that uh, speak those languages are probably used to bad translations, though. So they probably figure it out anyway. <laughs> <laughs> They're famous. I think, um, I think the bad translations that Microsoft committed in the early days that have just become the de facto way of doing things in certain languages um, because they can't change them. And I think that's one reason why I really like open source software for community translation because I think we build into the model that um, it's an iterative process and we fix things as we go along. So there's a space for communities who have no language experience to make mistakes and then fix them. So open source is pretty good for that. So uh, we've made pretty, pretty well boxed in what the problem is from the programmer's perspective. How does Poodle enable a community to assist with translation? Okay, so the one thing is um, is exposing the translations to people. So we found, so you know, because I hail from South Africa, we've got 11 official languages there. One's English, so that still means we have a problem of 10 languages. And there was a disconnect for me in terms of uh, the technical skills and the language ability. So the people that I could find that could program and could understand what we've just been talking about, even in its, in its simple form, um, weren't really interested in translating into a language like Klosa. But someone who spoke Klosa isn't really interested or doesn't really know some of the technical side. So we realized we needed to put some something in the gap there and that this would be a big problem around the long tail languages. Um, so obviously ones across Africa and, and Asia. Um, so where Poodle sits in the gap there is saying, well, how do we take this and present these, some of them quite complicated things, really, really simply. So um, for the plural form that we've just been trying to explain, we'd just really show people the six kind of spaces where they can type their plural forms in. Um, but from a translation perspective, um, we're looking at how do we build technology around what this person's doing that gives them things that really, really help them translate well. So that would be a really clean and cluttered interface. Um, the ability to make suggestions to allow non, call them non-translators to provide suggestions that other people can review, um, to do it in a safe web environment that doesn't require them to install any software. So they're not having to install a special editor. Um, and then in terms of the features that we look at at Poodle is like, how do we give people things that could make um, translation easier and better. So that'll be simple things like translation memory, which is 
basically all, all the translations that you, you've done before um, or other people have done before. So when you sing an expression like uh, save as, um, that you've seen how people have translated that before. Um, we put terminology into the interface so that people can see the word that people have chosen for spreadsheet is this and for word processor is this so that we can get some kind of consistency. And then we expose things where people have made some simple um, errors that we find new translators make quite a lot. And those will be as simple as um, not putting capitals at the start of sentences or ending them correctly with full stops. So we have technical checks um, and we've got all these things around them to make it easier for them to translate well. So it's really, we're looking at how do we take lessons that we've learned in the commercial translation industry and put them in a kind of safe, friendly way to a community that might not have that experience, but in a way that it just seems obvious that this is the right thing to do and this is the right information that they need. And uh, I imagine part of the challenge of this is that, uh, you know, especially uh, being a, a trained programmer myself, I tend to think of interfaces in terms of functionality behind the scenes and, and all that sort of stuff. I imagine, though, that what you're trying to address is the fact that people who primarily aren't programmers are coming to this website uh, to try to figure it out, and you're trying to lower the barrier of entry for that. Uh, how, how difficult is that process? In terms of lowering the barrier to entry or in terms yeah. of, yeah. Um, it is quite difficult. Um, um, it's One, it's difficult trying to convince some programmers that they should do this and that it's a good thing <laughs> to lower mm -hmm. the barrier of entry for people. Um, <laughs> in terms of um, in terms of lowering the barrier to entry, generally we've tried to look at um, taking it up when we're working with some of our clients is to say, um, every kind of step that they're requiring trans translators to do is to challenge a lot of those things. So we have a lot of people who say, well, um, we do our stuff in version control, which is great. We use version control for our software too. Um, but that's a barrier to entry to our translators and trying to communicate that to programmers to say, look, um, gets really great and easy to use, but maybe it's not the most important thing that this translator has to learn. Um, and we're concerned about quality of translation. So how do we can we eliminate that from your process um, and various steps? So that's that's one of the approaches we look at to lower the barrier to entry. Um, and the general approach we've taken with all our software for the barrier to entry problem is um, how do we how do we make things really simple? So um, you know, we've talked a lot about the web tool Pootle, but we also do a desktop tool called Fratal, which is also about you know there's some barriers to entry there. One is that in Certainly in Africa, connectivity is a real problem, so we still need a desktop solution. But how do we write a piece of software that doesn't ask people complicated questions up front about how they want to do their translation, but just allows them to translate straight away? Um, and so those are kind of the ways we, we try to approach the, the barrier to entry problem. Mm. And I'm curious to know how all this kind of links together. You mentioned, I was just about to ask whether you had a, a desktop version uh, for this as well, because obviously it's quite a different challenge uh, translating stuff online on, on the web than it is translating on the desktop. So is it would I pull in like a library or something and wrap, say, uh, my output in a function and then pass it through uh, Poodle that way? How would it all kind of flow together? So usually what we, we're looking at when in terms of what we call the, the kind of localization engineering process. Um, from a programming perspective, you really are getting to a stage where you've got your text that needs to be translated in a in some kind of standard format. So in open source, it's get text PO. The industry uses other things like XLIF, but they're just really formats um, that are for storing translations. So that's usually where the programmer kind of um, relinquishes control to Pootle. Um, and then Pootle then manages it from there. So we've got, in terms of, of the tools that we've we've built, we're really looking at how do we build a, a, a kind of set of tools um, that really helps develop localization in the, in the open source space. So we have a, a set of tools we call the Translate Toolkit, which is really, that's a, the localization engineering side. So that's where we play around with um, the text that we want to translate and um, we're able to do things like making debugged versions so that someone like me who can't speak Arabic can set up a right to left version of my software in a in a kind of English format. So that's the kind of uh, the 
the engineering side, um, mm-hmm. which most people don't see. And then on top of that, we build um, Poodle and Fatal, and those are um, then using the file format support we've built in the engineering side. So it's really, you know, we've been able to leverage quite a bit by building the the basic infrastructure. But from a programming perspective, as a programmer, you're probably not going to um, be using those kind of tools directly. Um, mm-hmm. But you're looking at getting yourself to a localization format. And if you've written your own format, um, if you're mad enough to have done that, um, <laughs> then extending the Translate Toolkit um, is a way to then you know, add your format to that. And then all of the tools like Putal and Fratal then just inherit the ability to understand your format, which makes it pretty powerful. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it sounds in- incredibly powerful. Um, I suppose we, we should step back a little bit and find out a bit about the kind of history of the project and how, how it got started. So how long has, has Poodle been around and what kind of kicked it off? So Poodle, we released Poodle in about December, I think it's December 2004. Um, mm. And actually we were working on, on tools before that, um, actually for a decade now, I think. So the first tool we wrote was um, was part of the Translate Toolkit and was allow- allowing us to easily translate the Mozilla suite. So even before the days of Firefox, looking at localizing. And and from a South African perspective, we were looking at that and saying, what are the tools we could choose to translate that would have the highest impact? So obviously, an email client that runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac was a great choice. But it was hard to localize. So we built, that was our first tool. Um, and then we quickly hit the, the reality that um, when we wanting to build a community and not use paid translators, we need something easy. Um, so yeah, we released that in December 2004. And some of the first places we used it was doing translator-thons at a number of universities. Um, and we've done some pretty successful ones around that. We had a, a translator-thon of about a thousand people in Makarere University in Uganda. So that was quite a nice way to see it scaling and seeing the ability to distribute work. Um, for a, on on a web platform and, and it working quite well. Mm. Uh, it, yeah, I mean that's a, a really really cool thing to hear about. Actually, I mean it's 2004. I was just thinking that f- for the kind of stuff we usually get on the show, often it's much kind of like you know people have started a couple of months ago or a couple of years ago. So <laughs> you've got a good good history there. So I, I imagine that the software and the translation, obviously the software improves over time and the translations as well because it's kind of drawing on all the knowledge of these people who are adding translations. So has that really leapt forward over the years with all the kind of stuff people are adding to it? Yes, I think the quality of the software we've seen grow quite a lot. So our software, we're seeing it improve. Um, in terms of the translations, um, it's kind of it, it's a. I think I think it does. Um, we we take the view that any first translation in any language is going to be rubbish, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is very hard to tell people when they start. Um, <laughs> but basically, they need to work from the principle that they know nothing about how the language works really. Um, and yeah, so the the, the translations improve. Um, but because Poodle is just used as a platform for a lot of people, um, it's, their, it's really their communities that as they grow are improving the quality of their translations. But we are lucky in terms of the open source world in that we can draw on all these translations. So um, we do run a service that basically hosts um, all the translations from places like LibreOffice and Mozilla and KDE and GNOME and allows that to be distributed. So someone translating um, some eclectic piece of software um, will get all the translations from um, from from all of those 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 pieces mm. of software. And if there's overlap, that will improve. But I think as we drive communities towards making terminology and 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 improving the quality, yeah, I think generally it does improve across the board. Mm. And and it seems like a sort of area where you, you could get a lot of duplication of effort of people constantly translating the same things as you say so it's really great that you can share stuff from big projects like LibreOffice and other things yeah. with the smaller projects that sounds like a really cool idea um so I'm, i was wondering about web browsers and how that kind of effect because web browsers have changed a lot since 2004 i'm pleased to say uh web browsers <laughs> have changed a lot since 2004 um and they've obviously they've leapt forward and they've changed the, has that affected how you guys do your work at all has that affected how you what possibilities for you with, with uh, yeah. uh, the web front end? Definitely, because I think in um, in fact I regret it in some ways. We we were we 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 talked in in two thousand and six, I think, of like why are we writing a desktop tool? We should just write a JavaScript 
um, web front end for Poodle, mm-hmm. um, which we, we said, no, we can't do that now because it's not very good. But that's the reality that has changed is that we can we can build really rich interfaces and a lot of the functionality we're presenting to people now and the illusions of speed are all because of changes that have happened since then. Um, I mean, things that we, I think, take for granted now, the, the fact that JavaScript is workable and you've got XML, RPC, comms and that kind of stuff. So those kind of things happening are just are great. Um, so that's really helped a lot. And I think in terms of in terms of the change we're seeing in terms of the web even uh, and the change of to mobile devices and that, that's changing, I think, a lot of where Poodle is being use, used and where it's being useful for people like we're seeing and even the demand for localization um, we struggled in Africa trying to convince people to localize because why would you bother because um, everyone has a pirated version of Windows and it comes in English and everyone who's got a computer speaks English um, now we've got the reality that everyone who's got a computer doesn't speak English because their computer is in their phone and we're seeing some rich apps there so that's a really interesting space um, that we're seeing develop for localization. Mm. And on the, the kind of subject of, of, of Africa and so on and, and all these developing nations, I was reading a bit earlier about uh, people using Poodle to translate the interfaces for the OLPC. Um, did, did you know anything about yeah. that or is that a side project? Or? Yeah, so there's a, I mean, it's a classic um, open source you, you develop pieces of open source software, and because you you know you've you've got no holds on it, people take with it and take it and run with it. So that's a you know it's a great use case of using the software. They've been using it for quite a while now, um, and hopefully we can get them onto the latest version as well. But that's a great way of 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 seeing um, the software able to to make it possible for people to translate. So we love we love that kind of use case. Mm. Now there are lots of uh, there are lots of different translate uh, tools out there and translation tools. So how would you compare uh, Poodle to some of the others we've got, like uh, Weblate and Zenata and some of the other things? Yeah, so they, I mean, there's a lot a lot has changed and there are lots being added and, and all that. From our side, we we look at it as uh, you know we've been we've been working in this space for quite a while. So um, for us, it's it's the passion around localization so people often ask me like am i a programmer or a localizer and my primary aim is a localizer and that's that's where we drive poodle from is that we want to build great software for translators um, and, and build an environment in which they can produce great translations and so in some ways programmers to us are secondary in that scale obviously we're delivering solutions that programmers use but i think that helps us um, differentiate um, where our focus is, um, and then we we're very focused on being an open source project, and we've been that from the beginning. You know, our codes hosted within a, a non-profit organisation, so it's really driven by um, the open source ethos. Um, so it's I think it's a marriage of prioritising the right people, um, being open source, and then being really passionate about localization and building tools to address those problems. Mm. And and how many how many people are involved? Uh, how many like, developers do you have working on it right now? Uh, is there a core team, and then you get patches from outside? How's that kind of look? Yeah, so we we do have a core team. So we've got in 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 our organisation in Translate, we've got um, three full time developers who work on it, and then there are a number of clients who use who use it and have some of their own developers and um, providing contributions. Um, but we've had and we're getting more um, contributions from outside people github has helped quite a lot in terms of encouraging contribution um so we've always been open to contribution but it's just made it a little bit easier and so we i think have seen a growth actually in the last two years for the number of people contributing um patches and fixes and features um to the products which is great yeah and um do you um do you uh, internationalize your own software with poodle you know is it kind of dog fooding <laughs> if you like yeah we do um, <laughs> we too, and probably the most pedantic we are about is um, RTL support, which isn't the best at the mm-hmm. moment. Um, but that's something we do do, and we look at it, at that quite a lot. Um, um, our biggest concern around software in terms of pushing the boundaries is RTL support, so right to left, 
or bidirectional, which affects languages like Arabic and Hebrew. Um, and that's usually for us a measure of how deep someone's passion is for localization, how good their software supports those. Um, so we do, we translate stuff. We've got a community that translates our own software. And we do a bit more than that. So we, you know, we, we're helping other clients do localization. So we pretty much get our, our hands dirty, um, you know, with, with um, Mozilla, we are actively helping um, support a number of um, minority languages. Um, well, that's a bad word. I always struggle to find a word for languages that are have a f- small number of Firefox users, but are spoken by 10 million people. Um, but we're helping support those long tail languages. And there we really get our hands dirty in terms of um, grappling with the problems that that those teams face in terms of getting their stuff translated and the barriers that they see in terms of the software. So yeah, we we dog food not only our own software but um, the localization process. Mm-hmm. Excellent. And um, so if I were to to set up a, a server uh, running uh, Poodle, I, I know it's a Python, it's a Django uh, Django based uh, yeah. with Python, obviously. So what would I need to run that? What kind of hardware requirements have I got? So in terms of hardware, pretty much anything that you you can run on now, like we run it on some really low-end Linode virtual machines, and we've oh. run it on just about anything. Um, so it's got quite low um, requirements. You know, if you wanted to throw it up quickly for a sprint, it's pretty low. Um, one of our focus has been on making it pretty easy to install. So um, you can install it on almost any server. Um, that's you know we we at the moment we recommend people um, using virtual ENVs, um, and that's made it pretty easy to deploy on modern hardware. Um, so it's possible to run it out the box. Um, if you don't want to set it up behind Apache, you can run it on its own web server. Um, so we're using some of the stuff from within Django um, mm. to deliver that. So you could run it quite quickly from out of the box following the installation instructions. If you want to set it up properly, then you're looking at setting up things like Apache and uh, Memcached. And that's all pretty well documented and so quite easy to do in a, in a, in a, mm. about an hour or two. Is, is it packaged in any of the, the major Linux distros that, that people might use on their servers and stuff? Are there any packages I could pull in? Or would I get yep, the code so the, and, and run it that way? Yeah, so there are packages. So... Um, Usually the ones that most people are deploying it on on Debian systems. So the you know, the problem with that is you do get a relatively old um, version of the software. Um, so it's possible to pull in packages um, on Debian and uh, Red Hat um, Enterprise Linux has got and Fedora. So those kind of main distros there will be. Um, the toolkit and Fatal are, are are available on most um, Linux distros. Um, yeah, so that's so it's pretty easy to choose a packaged version um although we kind of recommending people working on the latest stuff we've we've kind of adopted a development model of trying to um keep our master branch um stable so that people can pull um from the latest development um, and get a reliable working poodle so that's kind of where we're pushing people at the moment and is is there any kind of hosted services i could use so if i decided for whatever reason i don't want to set up my own server i just want to you know, farm that out to a third-party service. Are there any hosted services out there? At the moment, we're not directly doing hosted stuff, but people can and welcome to to chat to me and email me, and and we look at hosted stuff. Um, we're hosting for some people, um, and have some hosted versions um, for them, um, but we just have to put a little bit more infrastructure in place for us to do that properly as a an offering that we can give generally to the public. So what does this experience look like for me? Like, uh, okay, I've, I've got a smattering of Spanish now, and I want to actually go try my hand at it, translating real-world <laughs> stuff. How long would it take for me to sort of get used to the user interface? And what am I seeing when I'm doing a translation? Okay, so um, it's pretty it's pretty easy to get involved and get, get to it. So um, basically, if, if someone pushes you to um, your language, say, so, so you're looking at Spanish. They say, look at Spanish on on the server. You're going to see a list of projects that base that need attention and need work. So you'll see a clickable link that says, you know, these are the strings that need to be looked at. Um, clicking on that will take you directly into the translation interface. And then basically, what you're seeing is um, you're seeing all the strings that you would need to translate, um, kind of like a in a in a list form. 
So you're seeing the strings that went before and the ones that went after, and those give you some idea of, of the context, because um, obviously you don't have a lot of context in terms of translating software. Um, and then for each, um, what we call a unit, so that's a, a string that you'd be translating, you're going to see um, the text that needs to be translated, and you've got a text area in which you can type um, the text, um, the translation of your text. So. Beyond that, you've got some of the things that would help you. On your on your left, you'll see terminology that would say, you know, browser is translated into this word in in your language. So you can click on those and use those um, those things. And then if it finds if we find any kind of previous translations out there, um, those will be presented below, and you can click on one of those, make some adjustments, um, and submit it as your translation. So. Straight away, you in. You can either, if you've got translation rights, you can submit them as a translation. They go straight in. Um, or if someone's given you suggestion rights, same thing. You can click on it as a suggestion. That'll go to. That'll go in. It won't become an official translation, but someone in who's maybe got more rights in the team would be able to look at it and just review those and um, uh, um, accept them or reject them. And uh, so I was just going to ask about editorial process because I'd probably want to tell people I'm not that good at it yet. So please <laughs> have somebody else check it out before it goes any further. Yeah. Uh, is there a way for me to indicate my skill level to have people understand that they should uh, always review my stuff? So what we look at is you know, the, the team that's building. So we, we kind of devolve that to the team's responsibility. So the teams are setting up who they want to give rights to, et cetera. So any team that's giving you rights would look, make a decision about whether they want to give you full rights or um, want to limit your rights until they're happy with your skills. So we kind of devolve that to the teams and make them allow them to make their decisions around um, how best to interact with you. Cool. Uh, a little more technical questions, actually. Um, so is this... Did I hear right? This has always been a web application. Yeah, so Pootle's always been a web application. Obviously, there's the, the, the infrastructure behind that hasn't been. So the toolkit, the translate toolkit that understands all the formats, that's a desktop. That's a um, command line tool that we've been using. But Pootle's always been uh, a web front end. Well, then you probably weren't using Django to begin with, because I don't think it was around in 2004, right? <laughs> no. So we used our own. Um, framework and then migrated to Django probably uh, two, three, three or four years ago, I think. Um, and that's actually proved to be quite a good decision. It was difficult at the time trying to find a, a, a Python framework for the web. Um, so they were all kind of, it was very new, there wasn't much out there. Um, but Django has proved to be a good choice, luckily for us. And I see you work with uh, the, all the popular databases, SQLite for a minimal install, and but also uh, Postgres, which I really appreciate support for because a lot of people don't support Postgres, and also yeah. of course MySQL. Uh, what what uh, what where where did your choice of Django and probably even ultimately Python come from? So the choice of Python was um, you know, um, one of the first people that started helping us on the tools was a Python developer. Mm -hmm. So the first um, tool we wrote was basically driven by his um, his choice of language. Um, so at the time, I had I had no um, kind of preference for languages. Um, so that's why we started Python. And it's certainly from the command line side, it's been great. Um, it's worked out well for us with Django. It's been a bit more difficult writing desktop clients. Um, we, we use uh, GTK. Um, for our desktop client, um, and that's worked okay. We, you know, we've managed to deploy software on Windows and on Mac, um, but it's been difficult. It's difficult on Mac, um, mostly because because we're writing an application to allow people to translate. Most people who've de deployed products on Mac are not really worried about um, non-Latin input of text. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> you know, so if you're writing an IDE for for the Mac and using GTK, it's fine. You can use kind of normal Latin input. So that's really, that's been difficult for us there. Um, but it's great being able to have a language that's been able to allow us to deliver on the command line and uh, on the web and and GUI apps. Um, so it's proved to be a really good choice. I think I, I really love the language Python's grown and I've grown up with it. So it's been a good choice. 
Uh, what's, I, I'm not familiar, and you, you probably know the answer to this way better than I do. Uh, is there, uh, are there rules about using say, something like Google Translate to get a first order approximation or could, dropping it indirectly? Um, they're not really rules. They're just, you know, it's good, good form and it's quite difficult to, to communicate that to young translators. So there are two things. One, Google Translate doesn't exist for most languages. I mean, it supports a lot of languages, but it really yeah. doesn't exist. Um, and it supports some languages quite well, and some languages it doesn't really support well at all. So the quality of translation varies quite a bit. Um, Google's great. Um, I mean, they popularized the whole idea of just translation. So being able to find a Dutch website, news article, and read it in English, um, it's really good at that. But in terms of providing really good, soft, good software translations, it's not very good. Um, so when people understand the weaknesses and the strengths of Google Translate, it's great to be able to um, get an idea of, of terms that they might want to use. Um, the risk is always that you start translating, making your translation sound like Google Translate or Google Translate starts influencing it. So I think that's why we really focus on the kind of terminology choices, getting people to make terminology choices um, and build terminology banks up um, to do translation. Um, so there are a lot of risks around using Google Translate, unfortunately. Okay. Oh, well, good. It's, it's actually, I thought we, you were just going to tell everybody it's forbidden, but uh, it sounds like you just say, well, you'll find right. out eventually that it's not all that useful uh, when we're doing real stuff. So <laughs> cool. Hey, uh, uh, okay. So how, how I, I think you've been with the project since the beginning. What attracts this for you? Why are you still doing this after 10 years? I don't know. <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and the other things that you're doing after 10 years. So why? I, I think for me, it's, it's, I mean, I really, I really, really love um, the, the, the ability to impact people's lives. I mean, my history with it is really interesting because, I, I mean, I started doing localization because I wanted to promote Linux in South Africa. Um, and I thought, hey, this would be a great way to pump Linux onto a, a you know, this is 2001. You know, everyone will buy Linux servers if it's available in Zulu. Um, that was proved wrong, but um, it got me involved and in, in investigating it. And, and, and then I realized that I'm really passionate about um, the impact that this could have on people's lives. So, and I've still seen that, you know, the, you know, there's some lovely stories that came out of South Africa with someone using um, open office. We translated open office into a language called Pedi or Northern Situ. And she came from a very rural village that Hewlett Packard had just decided that they were going to airdrop tons of computer equipment and as an experiment. Um, the great spinoff for this woman from the, their experiment was that she found open office and basically she ran a business doing CVs and funeral notices, et cetera, and she couldn't speak English at all. And I think that's that's been the common thread for me, that there's such an empowering um, thing through localization and through language. So I think I'm really driven by the fact that we can have massive impact on people's lives. Um, and I'm passionate about that, how that um, fits in with open source because um, certainly coming from South Africa and seeing, you know, working with a lot of Africans, I've seen the, the changes that happen. So I've seen people beg Microsoft to translate stuff. I've seen them beg people to do it and I've seen them being hamstrung. And I think open source localization is really powerful because you don't have to ask anyone's permission. So you translate stuff and then you get um, translated software immediately. Um, and the benefit is once you release Firefox and LibreOffice, you basically get the commercial people coming and knocking at your door and off, offering you um, the opportunity to translate their software. So open source presents an interesting avenue for language activists to really push the agenda for language. And, and you know, I can list the number of languages where that's happened. So that's, I think that's why I still remain really excited. It's, um, it's the marriage of language activism and floss um, kind of present an amazing um, way to to influence social change. 
Yeah, I work a lot with the Brazilians, and they have a very similar problem in that the most uh, commercial markets don't see, or didn't at least a few years ago, see Brazil as big enough to even bother translating. Or the ones that did, did it to uh, Portugal Portuguese instead of Brazilian Portuguese, which has, a, yeah. it's, has its own dialect. In fact, in some cases, it's night and day in terms of the words, but I guess the Brazilians sort of figure out what the, what the people from Portugal are saying somehow. Um, just like, we can understand the Brits. It's a, we, we, there's a few words that are different. We sort it out. We sort it out. Yeah, but, but those Sad Australians, man, you can't understand the Australians at all. That's the hard part. Okay. Um, anyway, but... but um, but the, 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 the idea of having open source software being translated then because the commercial guys were falling behind, uh, I think really empowered the open source community in Brazil to the point now where even the government at, at multiple levels is saying, get rid of Microsoft, here's how you replace Microsoft entirely with open source software, and they're publishing documents based on that. And But the key was getting those translations out there, so I can really see what you're saying about the activism. Yeah, it's, it's a powerful mechanism. So it's, it's great for me. It's... Um, it's been great to try to see that, you know, to try to raise awareness amongst the open source community to see um, the language angle as an amazing opportunity. And I still see that opening, you know, it's still, and um, when there's too much of a commercial proprietary focus on things, um, there's an opportunity lost. And I see that with Android. Android's difficult to get localized. Um, so hopefully that gives some opportunities to Firefox OS um, to be more open and to to present that opportunity because I think f for a lot of markets language is a really powerful mechanism um, either for open source to get in or for people to carve a niche out for their products. Cool. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the development process. I presume you have an open code repo and uh, and I'm hoping it's probably something like GitHub or whatever so people can do pull requests if they have patches to submit. Yeah, so we, we, use, uh, we use GitHub. Um, we, don't, we don't require... Um, code assignment or anything so it's it's an open kind of model um so we do github we encourage people to give us pull requests which has worked out really well because we can do nice reviews within that um we have a bugzilla instance for doing bugs um, we use a um, piece of software that mozilla developed called scrum bugs to do um, our scrum process so that latches on to bugzilla um yeah, and I think those are the key pieces of software that we're using to do our, our process. We use, in terms of testing and stuff, we use PyTest to test all our software. Um, and for that, we've, you know, it's been quite useful to be able to then use um, Travis to automate that. Um, so we're starting to see the benefits of, of that automated um, build process um, in terms of our development as well. Uh, not familiar with PyTest, uh, not surprising, there's not much about Python, but uh, <laughs> is, can you do uh, full end-to-end -end sort of stuff of actually testing the web interface? Apparently, yes, but we, we haven't. We haven't <laughs> <laughs> and and how we got these three pieces of software, we, we kind of struggle <laughs> to push out that. But you, I understand you can, it so you can, you, can, um, um, you can do that, and that's kind of our next stage in terms of pushing out our test coverage and, and development testing is to really do um, automated testing around like real browsers pretending to be real users. And, and since you have a scrum process that obviously decides priorities, how does the governance work? So the scrum process is really for our internal process. So um, it really isn't a, I mean, it's a publicly exposed um, scrum, but um, we're not really prioritizing stuff um, outside of, of our core development team. Um, so there's no, so at the moment, that's just an internal process, um, which we just make public. I understand you're just about to release, is it 2.5.0? I see like RC1 or RC2 when I went to the website. Uh, how long before that's actually released and what's on the roadmap after that? So yesterday I would have released 2.5.0 final, but <laughs> we had some issues on some other software, so I had to look at that. But that's, um, so basically 2.5.0, we pretty much happy that it's it's ready and stabilized. So we had quite a long process for 2.5.0, um, just because we changed our process and did quite a major refactoring. So it's taken quite a long time to stabilize. We pretty happy for people to deploy 2.5.0 RC1 because um, that's quite stable. Um, in terms of the process moving forward, we've changed our development process quite a bit. So we will work on a, a master being stable, like I said earlier. So basically, you should be able to pull from the Git repo and it should just work. Um, there should be very little risk of, of 
stuff breaking. Um, and then every six months, we're looking at a, a point release um, for people that need to package or want to work from those. Um, and then in terms of features that we're looking at, we're building in um, probably the major ones we'll be looking at um, um, from our side, looking at deployment, easier deployment. Um, but the critical ones um, in terms of user-facing um, or user-facing um, will be fleshing out our, our API and allowing people to interact with our API. Um, so we've got some clients that need that to integrate um, their solutions with Poodle. So we'll flesh that out. Um, and then we've got a, quite a lot of changes we're making in terms of kind of the user side of things, um, how, how to be able to review stuff, work that other people have done and that you've done and um, how to be able to um, see more of the community side and community interaction side. Hmm. Okay, so uh, Dwayne, I've got a slightly off the wall question for you here. One of the first things okay. I noticed when I when I loaded the Poodle website was that it says in the middle there that Poodle will ensure the best quality by automatically detecting common errors that translators make and fix them. How yeah. how does it do that? That sounds incredibly clever. <laughs> well, it doesn't fix the. <laughs> oh, I better sorry, see sorry. what it says. There. <laughs> You're right. It says automatically detect errors. I, I say I, I put in the fix them bit. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically, what we look at there is, I mean, we just started writing tools for our own use to pick up, um, kind of, uh, what we call technical technical errors, um, and they're quite a good measure of the quality of translation. That's that's how we first started looking at it. Um, translators who are really good at their craft. Um, seem to make less of these errors and new translators make a lot of them. So it was pretty easy for us to write some um, technical checks. And you can think of the pretty basic would be um, the English, the source string started with a capital, does yours start with a capital? Um, so we wrote a, a number of those tests. We have about 40 to 50, I think, at the moment, um, just to do some pretty simplistic stuff like that. Um, and it's quite easy for people to write their own tests and to then adapt them for their languages. So we adapt tests for languages that allow us to to detect some of those things. And we'll keep growing those things to be able to do some other, we hope in time, more sophisticated tests around terminology. But how Poodle, in terms of Poodle working with that, so um, when translators are translating um, uh, and they're going through units, it's it's not live at the moment, but um, you know, if they were reviewing units, they'll see um, any of those checks that fail. Um, they're able to either see them while they while they're editing, um, or they can step through those. So we categorise a lot of them um, whether they're fatal kind of errors or just cosmetic. So a lot of things are cosmetic. Um, whether they use correct capitalisation is a cosmetic kind of issue, um, but it allows us to check and catch things like which are uh, very common errors, which are people translating named variables. So if you've got a variable like dollar file, it's very tempting to translate that to in Afrikaans dollar lair. So those kind of translation errors often, often happen. Um, so in Poodle, we expose those. So the one view that you, you know, when you come into your project for for say you're translating Afrikaans, um, one thing is you're looking at how much work needs to be done. The other way is looking at um, which checks are failing and it allows people to quickly enter into those types of checks, um, find the errors and then correct them. That's uh, fascinating. I, I, now I'm interested in the technology there. Are you doing that all with just simple regular expression writing or do you have a higher level description language for c categories of errors or what? Well, so it's kind of, I think regex is a, Proved quite a problem because they're quite expensive, so we've tried to avoid some of those. Um, but some of them are are pretty easy to to set up once you understand the problem that you're trying to address. Um, but we kind of have we built a framework um, that allows us either to look at um, the text as a source target kind of concept. So we're just looking at the strings. We don't care about any other kind of data. So. Um, if you're thinking in terms of the Poodle interface, that's the English text and your target translation. And then it's easier to be able to trans to write any function um, to extend that because it's just a it's just a function that inherits um, the ability to know that it's it's going to get a piece of source text and a piece of target text and it must return true or false, whether it fails or succeeds. Um, and then another level which allows us to then be a little bit more elaborate that takes the whole unit. Um, so it takes a lot of the meta information. So is this 
um, is this a unit that has that occurs in a certain part of the software so we can adapt the test's behavior knowing that it comes from the help documentation or, or whatever. So some of that is um, is uh, project specific. So we do adapt the tests, you know, um, whether it's Mozilla or LibreOffice or whatever, we adapt um, some of those tests for that. Um, so it's quite easy for people to, I mean, it's one way to contribute if someone is geeky enough to be able to code and they want to improve their language to be able to say, a, either write tests that were that would help um, um, improve that kind of quality, um, but also look at ones like you know if someone spoke Arabic, for instance, how do we adapt all of these tests to behave better for um, an Arabic translator? Cool. Oh, we're almost out of time, but this has been fascinating so far. Um, what are you looking for? Any kind of particular people uh, to contribute to the project, or are you pretty well covered for resources? I, I, I bet I know the answer to that one. But are you looking for any particular kind of people? <laughs> yeah. So I'm asking an open source project if they need more resources. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always know the answer to that. Yes. <laughs> um, I think the types of people we're looking for are people that are localizers who program. I think they're really the people we're trying to look for. Um, and the exciting for, thing for people who want to contribute is that um, when we've looked at hiring people, you know, we've, we've advertised far and wide and seen some amazing people. And it always seems that the people we hire are the people that um, have contributed in some ways to the project. Um, so we've been able to evaluate um, their kind of level of contribution. But we're always looking for people who can translate Pootle and Fatal, so translating the tools. But in terms of programming resources, we I think the skills we kind of looking for now are um, um, people who've got like JavaScript UI skills or kind of UX design skills, um, people who um, have skills around deployment kind of issues, and then in terms of programming on our tools, um, we're looking at people who the ideal would be someone who is not a mother tongue speaker who programs in Python, um, because then they've got a and a kind of a sensitivity around language issues. Cool. Uh, you know, I should have asked this earlier because this might be a long answer, but uh, keeping in mind we're almost out of time. <laughs> um, uh, what's the what's the financial model behind Poodle? It sounds like an amazing project. It's an open source project. How do you how how is it funded? Okay. Um, so the initial funding for Poodle, we we ran it initially out of a, a foundation in South Africa. And we've spun off a uh, full profit out of that. So the funding model at the moment is we we have uh, we we do still um, look for grants, um, but we have a number of paying clients, um, and then we're growing it out into we'll do um, we will do a hosted solution to be able to um, make it easier for people to use that, and we'll build. So our model will really be about um, or is around um, paid development on Poodle and integration with people's systems. Um, and then expanding that into a hosted model. Cool, cool. Okay, and, and did, did I miss anything? This has been, like I said, a fascinating conversation, but we're just about out of time. Is there anything really urgent that you want to make sure our audience knows about? Um, nope, nothing. Oh, well, probably the only <laughs> message for me is <laughs> is um, is to prioritize localization in your projects. Um, well, that's a, a really well, important thing. Worthy message, absolutely. Um, and, and of course, I have to ask my two required questions, or I get email about it the next day. I, I now I've made this such a tradition. I have to do this, but I better know the answer to the first one. What's your uh, favorite scripting language? Oh, it's Python. There we go. I After said Bash. <laughs> After that, what? After Bash. After Bash. Okay, that's good enough. All right. And uh, what's your favorite text? Oh, it's Vimal Emacs. That's a logical one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I can't win on any of these shows anymore. I cannot win. I cannot win. Uh, but it's okay. Well, uh, Dwayne, it's been <laughs> awesome talking to you. I'm inspired by what you're doing with Poodle. Uh, and I, and like I said, I've personally experienced the results of people being empowered by having a, a software localization in, in their native language. Uh, so I appreciate what you're doing, and I'm glad you're doing it. Thanks for being on the show. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Very good. That was Dwayne Bailey. He's the founder of Translate and a project manager, sometimes dev, on Poodle for Chow and the Translate Toolkit. Uh, sounds like a lot of fun. D uh, Dan, what did you think? I almost called you Dwayne. <laughs> Dan, what did you think? <laughs> That's okay, uh, Richard. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, um, yeah it's, it's really a fascinating project, actually. And I, I was quite shocked when they said 2004. 
Um, yeah. That's obviously got a great pedigree there. I think, unfortunately, uh, something that, that Dwayne was trying to get across there is that um, it, it's changing a bit now, but traditionally translation hasn't been that important to a lot of developers. Um, it's come somewhere below documentation, I think, for a lot of people, um, which, <laughs> is, which is a real shame. Yeah. And it's so important because, yeah, I mean, as you, as you pointed out, we had some great examples there. Uh, it's so important for people to be able to access the software in a language that they understand. Absolutely, and and just uh, I would say it's probably also below good UX design. You know, it's like <laughs> it's like yes. uh, you know I'm I'm horrible. My 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 websites that I've built over the years, they just have like the boxes with the label in front of it, and then you know, and then a, a submit button that says submit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no UX yeah. at all. So I, I appreciate it when somebody actually does something that looks really nice. And we are getting a lot of modern toolkits now to do that sort of stuff. And I, I know they're using a jQuery behind the scenes here on, on Poodle, and uh, from what I was able to survey it before. And uh, that jQuery has just been an amazing asset to the to the web UX interface there. So, and things like Dart coming along. I've been researching Dart quite a bit in the last few weeks uh, after having interviewed them. Uh, them, so just one guy, <laughs> interviewed them as a project. That's what I meant to say. Uh, and and, and it, it, I tell you, the desktop the desktop experience is getting better as a web interface, you know, be, mm -hmm. you're getting the desktop, the full desktop experience now, uh, whereas, you know, say five, 10 years ago, that wasn't even possible. So I'm glad for that. Uh, anything else? Mm. And I, I think the important thing about, well, you mentioned jQuery, which we're getting slightly off the topic, but things like that is, is that they, you know, they'll work on almost any device and, and we're not tied into proprietary platforms, which is great. That's what we need is more standards and more translations. Cool. Cool. Um, okay. Well, speaking of, new projects and other projects that are interesting. We uh, have a very short list of ones that are already booked. I sent out maybe like 20 pieces of email. I don't know what it is. Maybe my mail's not going out or something, but um, I did actually get a response this morning from uh, a, a key figure that uh, I've wanted to get on the show for a long time, and he's just looking at uh, the option of three or four different dates since Q2, but I can't confirm that yet, so I won't be mentioning that. But next week, as contrasting and comparing, we do in fact have WebLate, which is another online translation system. Uh, did I, I don't remember? Did Dwayne talk about what the difference in this and WebLite? Or was it just in general that Poodle's further along? Um, yeah, I think it was just in general. I did mention WebLite in, in the question, but I'm not sure he specifically answered it. Maybe maybe he was being diplomatic, knowing that they're coming on next week. Well, that's cool. And could tune in next week, and we'll ask them how do you compare to Poodle? <laughs> you have the <laughs> yeah. last say. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, ours isn't written in Python, huh? No, no, no just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. I should stop that. Uh, and then following show after that that we have scheduled right now is Ceph. And that's a distributed object store and file system that's designed to provide like an S3 style interface or an actual mounted disk. Uh, but it scales well with replication and high performance and all sorts of good things. Uh, really looking forward to that. That's actually the basis of a lot of other projects that are starting to come out now in terms of cloud space and stuff. Like last week when we talked about CloudStack and how it can interface with Ceph, that was really exciting to see if they're playing together. And then... The return of the bacon, return of the bacon. John O'Bacon will be talking about the Ubuntu <laughs> phone. And uh, like I said, I'm sorry we miscommunicated a few weeks ago and I had to cancel his show because he was all ready. I just didn't know it because he didn't reply to the email there, there, there Mr. Uh, Mr. Jono. Anyway, so he'll be back on, not as a, a host, but as a guest. So we'll have to get the appropriate co-host for that one. Uh, I'm still sending out the emails for Q2. Um, I realized that I also have an inbox that's full of things for Floss Weekly, and I need to go through those, too, because I bet people have written me and said, I want to be on the show right away, and this has been like four months ago. So um, I need a secretary. I just, I just need a secretary to do this. Uh, you can see that list of ones that I've already sort of processed and are in the uh, queue. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Floss There's a spreadsheet that... Um, that uh, has the big list there. And if you have a project that you want on Floss Weekly and isn't on that list, please feel free to email me, Merlin at StoneHinge.com, and I will try to get a hold of them. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we tape this show live. We have a chat room. We took a couple of questions from the chat room. Uh, you can uh, go to live.twit.tv at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. Uh, please check the schedule at twit.tv slash Floss uh, to know, or the spreadsheet link from there, to find out when we actually have shows, because we've got a couple shows we got to skip coming up, so uh, be sure to go there. And occasionally we do show on, on an odd time, but that's usually what we're doing. Uh, you can see what I'm doing by going to Merlin M E R L Y N on Twitter or Identica, but mostly I'm on Google Plus these days. Randall L Schwartz on Google Plus. I talk a lot about what's happening for me, not just technical stuff. I'm actually talking a lot about my new way of eating that's uh, gotten me down 45 pounds. Uh, at my I'm now at my goal weight, and it's six inches uh, smaller around the waist, and my blood pressure's back to normal. And this morning I'm drinking what I'm drinking almost every morning, which is tea 
with a, a teaspoon or a tablespoon, depending on what I feel like, of coconut oil in it. I tell you, it is such an amazing taste and full of uh, MCTs, uh, medium chain uh, uh, hydrocarbons. So they go right into your bloodstream and provide energy right away and good energy for a long while. Um, I will be missing the show in two weeks. In fact, related to my new style of diet, I'm going to be on the Low Carb Cruise, the 2013 Low Carb Cruise with about 150 other people that are all like-minded about that, including my mentor, Andy Lopez, who taught me all about this. I'm going to tell him I mentioned him on the show, and he'll probably buy me a drink. So good. Uh, that's enough plugging for now. Oh, anyway, even though I'm going to be gone, the show is still slotted. Uh, we don't have a guest for it yet. I'm working real fast on that, but uh, hopefully uh, uh, the show will still go on, uh, even though I am going to be on the cruise. I'll be back the following week, though, probably completely forgetting how to do the show again. Uh, there we go. Dan, anything uh, you want to plug today? Uh, yeah, well, just the usual, really. If you want to head along to danlynch.org, which is my website, you can find about uh, find out about, I should say, all of the podcasts and things that I do on there. Uh, much, lots of stuff about Linux and open source, lots of stuff about music, lots of random stuff, uh, all kinds on there, and also links to all of the social networks, so obviously Twitter, Google+, uh, Facebook, all of those kind of things. So, yeah, come and say hello. Do you have a random number generator on your site, too? I don't know. I should do, shouldn't I? I should yeah, do now. I, I need to translate my site now as well. Actually, so. <laughs> put a little, put a little, uh, put a, just a little, put a little heading and then below it say random things and just say, here's your random number for the day or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, like the magic eight ball or something. I'll have like a magic eight ball on the yeah, that's a really good go. idea. There you go. See, yeah, I, this is what I know how to do. I, I know how to do it as a programmer. I just hate doing it as a user interface. It's so silly, silly <laughs> for me. Okay, well, we are running a little over, so i got to get going. So we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.